Our next lecturer is doc, Dr. Philip Bogus, and his lecture is going to be on banking and financial markets. Philip? Uh, hello again. So, um, today I will first outline what the function of financial markets is in a free society, and then I will compare it with our system of financial planning. So, financial ma markets in a free society work as intermediaries uh, of savers and investors. So, commercial banks, savings and loan banks, mutual funds, investment banks, they serve as intermediar intermediaries to co connect savers and investors. Why do we need intermediaries? Well, take a producer of tomatoes. Maybe he knows very much how, to, very, very good. He's very good in growing tomatoes, but he's not so good, or does he does not have time to look for his customers to market his uh, his production. So, financial institutions connect savers that offer, that offer present goods and investors that demand present goods. Um, and why don't they connect directly lenders and borrowers, for example? I mean, of course they do, and sometimes they can, and sometimes they do. But again, in, mo in most cases, it's just more convenient to have specialists doing the job. And that is done by intermediaries. Uh, intermediaries can also tailor to one's needs. So banks, for example, can receive many small loans and give one big loan to a company. And they con can also divert risks. When I take all my savings and I give them to my friend, uh, then I'm putting all X in one basket. Uh, when I lend to, to the bank, and many other people lend to the bank, and the bank gives many, uh, grants many loans to different borrowers, then I'm not putting all the X in one or the bank is not putting all the eggs in one basket. So what, what are the options to finance uh, in financial markets? One is equity financing that would play a much bigger role in, in a free, free market. Uh, now equity fi financing is pushed aside by the artificially cheap uh, credit. So if you take a, a balance sheet, equity financing looks like this. We have here the assets, the liabilities, and equity financing is to get cash, for example, $1,000. And then you have here the equity, the shareholders that finance you $1,000. You can also finance yourself through by issuing bonds. It would be just you issue a bond on your liability side of $1,000, and then you get more cash. Now I have cash 2000 mm. So in both, case, in both cases, private savings are channeled into investment, and this is often done through intermediaries, or intermediaries or also through investment funds, etc. And another, a third possibility is to um, do it through savings and loan banks or commercial banks that serve as a true inter intermediary. So a bank, for example, a bank has a, its balance sheet, and it receives a loan from customer A of $1,000, then it gets the cash here. Let's say the loan is 10%, and then it receives on the one hand and it grants a loan on the other hand, then it grants a loan to a company to Company B of $1,000 and the cash goes to 
this company at 15%. So then there's a profit for the bank. It has functioned as a true financial intermediary. Well, another important institution in financial markets in a free society is banking for safekeeping. That is totally different. The most important reason why we hold money is Due is the uncertainty of the future, as I explained yesterday. Because if I, if I hold money, I can react to opportunities or to problems that arise because I own the most liquid good that everyone wants to have. If I have money, I'm, I rule. And an important service is to have a bank that is safe keeping the, mon safe keeping the money for me and that gives me additional services such as bookkeeping service or payment services. And safekeeping and deposit uh, contracts also ex exist for other goods, for other non-specific uh, goods. Those goods are also called, called fun fungible goods, uh, such as oil or wheat. So for instance, for wheat, several farmer, farmers put their wheat in one big silo. Instead, that every, every one farmer, farmer has his own small silo. So the grains of wheat are mixed in this big silo because it's cheaper to store it there. And then when you, you pay, you, you deposit your, your grains of wheat and when you receive it, you may not receive or you will not receive the same grains of wheat, but the same quantity and quality. And the Latin word is tantundem. You receive the tantundem, the same quantity and quality of what you deposited. And it's the obligation of the depository, the owner of the silo, to maintain the tantundem the same quantity and quality of the good deposited, always available to the depositors. And legally, it's a misappropriation if uh, the owner of the wheat silo uses the wheat for his own ends. And what is true for wheat is also true for money. Imagine that, uh, imagine that I'm a uh, I'm a cashier at a big grocery store that closes over the weekend. On Friday night, I'm the last, last one that uh, leaves the store, switches off the lights, and there are $1 million in cash. I'm responsible, I'm safekeeping it for the weekend, but I have an idea. Why not take the money and have it work for me over the weekend? I have a little investment. So I take the money, a big plastic bag, and carry it on to the next casino, roulette, simple game, no? everyone understands it, one million dollars on red, and then ping, red. Two million dollars on Monday morning before the store opens, I'm the first one in the, in the office and I put the one million back. No one has noticed. How clever am I? No? <laughs> How stupid are the rest? I've done, I haven't done damage to anyone, obviously, and I won one million dollars. I've done nothing wrong. Well, of, of course I've done nothing wrong. I, I'm a criminal, and in, in any country, civilized country of the world, I would go to pr prison, even if I return on Monday morning the one million dollars, because I'm guilty of a misappropriation. Of course it could also go wrong. No. It, it, it's black, for example. Uh, oh, I personally know the case of a wheat depository, because uh, 10 years ago, I, I did an internship with a lawyer in the US. US. I, I remember it perfectly, the depository, his name was called Barney. He was friends with other farmers, and they deposited uh, the wheat with him, and he sold the wheat because he thought after the harvest, the price of wheat will fall, and then I will buy it back cheaply again. What happened was the price of wheat this time kept on increasing, and when his farmer colleagues wanted their wheat back, he didn't have it. Um, so they went to court. Um, we went, we visited Barney in prison with, his, with this orange, nice orange suit. Um, and in, it was touching in, in the court because the other farmers were, were crying, his farmer friends. They were saying, Barney, how could you do that to us. We, trust, we trusted you with the wheat. We had trusted in you. So for misappropriation, you go 
to jail, also for money, if I deposit money with one of you, and you use it, you go to jail. So this is true for all economic, economic agents except for one. For bankers, if it happens that you have a banker's license, you can use it, you got a privilege. And always when one group of people get a privilege, an exception of a general rule, there will be social harm. It takes the rule, for example, you should not kill other people. It's forbidden for all people to kill, but there's one group of privileged people who can, at their will, shoot others. Of course, there will be social harm. And the same applies here. And we have the rule to man maintain a 100% reserve ratio for deposits, but bankers are allowed to use the money. There are harmful, there are harmful consequences. Uh, you, um, Roger Garrison explained an awesome business cycle theory to you already. So however, however, in a free society, this would be enforced for anyone. And then if you have a safekeeping bank here, a safekeeping bank, as its liabilities, so you, someone deposits its cash there, and gets here a, a, a deposit or a bank account. $1,000 appear here. This is only a memorandum item, so this is because this does not form assets. Uh, this does not really form assets of the bank, it's just a memorandum item. And then the customer pays the bank for the safekeeping and custody and additional services, uh, a fee. And the money, of course, forms part of his cash balance. Uh, it provides him to reduce uncertainty. And even if the bank goes bankrupt, the money will be there because it's not being touched by the safekeeping bank. So we have to keep in mind this. These two kinds of banking are totally, totally different. And this is important because mainstream economists tend to confuse the two and mix them, arguing that loans and de demand deposits would be the same. Uh, but there are important differences between the two, loans and deposits. And there are three economic differences. <clears throat> the first one is in a loan, economic difference. The, the first one is in a loan there, there are present goods exchanged against future goods. So we exchange money today against money in one year, for example. While with the deposit, there's no exchange of present goods against future goods. The demand deposit is a present good. Second, uh, in the case of the loan, the full ability of the availability of the money is transferred from um, the lender to the borrower. And the availability is transferred. While in the demand deposit, the depositor maintains a complete availability of the money. The third difference is that in, in the loan, case of the loan, there are interest payments. Uh, because there is an exchange of present goods against future goods, while in the demand deposit, a deposit of wheat, et cetera, of more money, there are no interests. On the contrary, the, the, the depositor pays a fee for the safekeeping services. Then there are legal differences. The first legal difference is that the essential element of the contract in case of the deposit is the custody and safekeeping of, of the money or the tantundem. In the case of the loan, the essential element is the transfer of the availability from the lender to the borrower. The second legal difference is that um, in case of the deposit, there's no term. It's on demand. Any time you can demand the money. While in the case of uh, the loan, of course, there must be a term, a one-year loan, 10-year loan. And the third difference is, legal difference is the obligation. The obligation of uh, the borrower is to return the tantundem, the money, at the end of the uh, agreed term plus the interest. 
why the obligation of the depository is to have the deposited good, the wheat or the money always available, available to the, depo the depositor, depositor. In the case of money, that means a 100% reserve ratio. So this is how financial markets would look like in a um, free society. There would be a clear distinction between loan and deposit contracts, and there would be true financial intermediation and um, much more equity, equity and long-term financing than today. So let's now look how financial planning today looks like, how state intervention dist distorts this picture. So governments, governments want to spend. They like to spend, they want, like to buy votes, they want, they want, want to get, get support in the population, they want to get re-elected. So one way to finance uh, government expenditures is through taxes. But taxation, you know, is very impopular because it shows clearly to the population that the government goodies uh, do not come for free but have a cost. So if you as a government have the control over the money supply, you may just produce monetary uni units to pay for your expenditures. So you don't have to knock on the door of your citizens and at the point of a gun demand taxes. Taxes is like the visible fist of, of the state. The alternative is to just produce money and if it's paper money, it almost costs you nothing to produce it and then you buy the resources you need. As a result, prices will rise and the costs will be spread on the population in form of a relative loss in the purchasing power of mana, money. But this is less visible. This is the invisible hand of the government stealing from the citizens. And the citizens do not notice this as much as they do with taxes. So it has, th therefore it has been always in the interest of the state to control not only money but also the financial system. Historically, the process in which the state has corrupted and invaded the monetary system has been slow and gradual. First, the state has taken the monopoly to mint coins, allegedly to prevent fraud because it, they thought that private issuers of coins, they would write like 100 grams of a gold coin that would be only 50 grams. Even though competition uh, would prevent fraud there as in any other in industry, like when a company would sell milk and write one gallon of milk on it and it's only half a gallon in it, then competition competitors would capitalize on, on this fraud, the same with money. However, the state used this as a presumption to, to assume the monopoly of coinage and started then to de debase coins, no? Co collecting old coins and reminting, reminting the coins, for example, gold coins, adding copper to it. And then with the additional coins, the state could purchase what it wanted. Later, the state granted the privilege uh, of banks to have fractional reserves to violate the legal um, principles of the deposit contract. This led to business cycles, and in the recessions, normally the bank's assets lose in value, there are bad loans, and people lose confidence in banks. And then in, the, in this financial crisis, people and banks demand help, because they, they think they will lose their deposits, they will lose everything, so they demand help, in, which then comes in form of a central bank, where the gold reserves were pooled. However, central banks could, not, could neither save all banks in a recession because also the gold reserves of the central bank are finite. That is, the central bank cannot produce gold to save the financial system. So the next step in the logic of monetary interventionism was that the central bank mm, obtained the monopoly on money substitutes, on banknotes. Uh, banknotes were like warehouse receipts that you, you deposit 100 grams of gold and then you get a receipt and you could always go with a banknote and re redeem the gold. So the central bank assumed the monopoly to issue um, bank banknotes. Supposedly, 
to be able to save the financial system when it came into trouble. Then, of course, in an emergency situation that threatens the financial system with a total collapse due to redemption of, uh, of depositors, so the, the, the state always declared then that it was no longer possible to redeem the banknotes in gold. This has happened when the World War, World War I broke out or in the US during the Great Depression. So then the notes and bank and tick, money tickets were not redeemable into gold anymore, but they continued to be used as a medium of exchange for several reasons. First, they were protected by legal tender laws, so you had to accept them. And people were also told that the um, suspension of redemption would only be temporary, and also that they had an advantage, these notes, because taxes had to be paid with them. So now, then we had fiat paper money that could not be redeemed into gold anymore. And now central banks can produce any liquidity necessary to save the fractional reserve banking system in a recession and in a banking panic. However, there still remains a limit to inflation since uh, not all central banks inflate in the same rhythm. Some central banks inflate faster than others. And when they do this, when they inflate faster than others, um, there is an embarrassing devaluation or depreciation of the currency. It can harm financial cooperation, international cooperation. It's also a clear sign to the population that there's something, something wrong, that your currency is, uh, has less value every day. And the population may want to adopt foreign currency. So, um, the, difference, the different rhythm in, in inflation is a problem for central banks. For example, the German Bundesbank inflated traditionally less than other central banks, such, such as the Fed or the Bank of France. That's the reason why it then was brought under control through, uh, through the ECB, through the Euro, the Bundesbank. So this explains that there's a tendency to a world fiat currency, which is the logical end of the monetary interventionism in the financial system. So once fiat money is installed in any country, the government through its central bank has the absolute control over the money supply. The central bank has then the power, incredible amount of power. Um, it would be impossible to assume in a free society. While communism collapsed, uh, in 1989, 1990. The, the central bank still continues in, in, in the monetary sphere. The Fed and the ECB, they exert total control on, on, the, money, on the monetary sphere. They have, to power, they have the power to create money as at their will. And this is important because the whole welfare, welfare st state depends on this, on this monopoly on, on money. So now, I, so now I would like to do a thought, another thought experiment with you. Imagine that you had the power the Fed has. The Federal Reserve has. You would be the only person that can produce money. Let's say you just can print it with your computer, or more simply you just uh, uh, you can access online your bank account and you put, can put any number in it. And everybody would have to uh, uh, accept the money you produce. Then you would have a power that is comparable to, to the ring in Lord of the Rings. <laughs> uh, would you use this power? You know, the ring is it's almost irresistible. The temptation is almost irresistible. In, in fact, Gandalf didn't want, didn't want the ring. <laughs> You, because actually you might try to do something good with it, but the result of the setup always would be a permanent flow of goods and services to you, your friends, and your family. And of course, this would lead to for a tendency for prices to increase. For example, if you buy, want to buy a BMW, you just produce new money, 
and then you would have to overbid the person that would have bought the car if you had not produced the additional money, so prices are bid up. Now you get the BMW, the other person don't, does not. And then the dealer has more money and the dealer may want to buy a coat for his wife, bidding up prices of coats and then the coat producer's income is higher and he starts spending and gradually, as I explained yesterday, the new money extends through the economy, increasing prices and changing the stream of goods and services toward, towards the first receivers of the new money. So the power of the printing press is virtually irresistible. Ir irresistible. But you have to be very careful not to overdo it for several reasons. People might start to uh, resist the scheme and try to destroy your power. When they see that you just have to print money and you get richer and they get poorer all the time, they may revolt. So before it gets to this point, uh, you may want to restrict your money production. What can you do beside? Well, you can try to get important and powerful allies in the establishment. So let the establishment participate in the scheme by channeling some money into their pockets make them dependent on the system and make them dependent on the continual increase in the money supply. Then the establishment will always support you and the money system, monetary system in itself. They will use their power and influence also in the media to support the system. What can you do further? Well, there are other means of diluting the source of, the source of unrest, and resist, unrest and resistance. Uh, so you could develop a, a strategy to conceal the money cre creation and create diversion, diversions. So you may transfer the new money, the new money through several steps in a very complicated system whose mechanisms are very hard to grasp. You may also try to conv convince people that actually the scheme is good for them. Uh, yeah, you may say well, what you're doing is actually you are stabilizing the price level or you are altruistically trying to spur employment, to increase employment, which, by the way, are the two uh, official goals of, of the Federal Reserve, to pr uh, stabilize the price level and to increase employment. People may, people may actually start to like you claim that without you, the financial system would collapse. Uh, one important point is also that in your, in your arguments, you should always concentrate on, the effect, on one effect of your monetary increase in the money supply, that is um, lower interest rates uh, at a reasonable level. Uh, so you say that what you're actually doing is controlling the interest rates, which is the effect of your policies. And don't mention ver very much what you're doing what you are doing to manipulate them, that is uh, producing more money. Uh, say that with lower interest rates, more investments and employment is possible. Metaphors are always very useful. Say that your money production is like the lubric lubricating oil necessary for the smooth functioning of the economy. And of course, de de develop fancy theories to support your scheme. I mean, you can externalize, externalize this to, uh, so you have more free time, so hire some economists to, to develop the theories. Um, one, one thing you may argue is what you are, do, what you are doing is necessary to prevent is the disaster of uh, falling prices. Uh, so you want to spread the myth and that falling prices, that price deflation is disastrous for the economy and that the money supply must increase at least as fast as the economy grows. Yeah. Yes, you can always then say in the gold standards this would not occur, so, we, so <laughs> thanks to my money production we can have more economic growth. Another idea to spread is that the banking system needs new money and would otherwise collapse with apocalyptic consequences. And then you have achieved your end finally when the victims and losers of the scheme actually start to think that you're doing something good 
for them by producing more money. Now, when you're at this point, you must be careful not to disturb the economy too much by your money production, because you don't want to have too much chaos, because you still want to be able to buy your BMW and enjoy some technological progress. Because if, if people stop saving and investing due to inflation, then car production may be also hampered. And if uncertainty increases too much or the monetary system breaks down, you will have to forgo many advantages of the division of labor. So if the newly produced money causes too much dis disturbances and distortions in the form of business cycles, productivity may be hampered too much, and this might be not in your interest. Surely you don't want hyperinflation or the monetary system to collapse, because then no one would want your new money anymore, and your power would be gone, your ring would be broken. So, and as mentioned before, it's important for you to cover your tracks, and this can be done by erecting a complicated financial system that is hard to understand. So you may give some privileges uh, to some in exchange for their eternal friendship and help. And this privilege consists in let them participate in your power. Give them some sort of franchise in money production. And these, uh, these, these your friends, we may call them fractional reserve bankers, they cannot print money themselves, but if they hold money reserves with you, they will be allowed to produce money substitutes, demand deposits, for example. So let's look at a simple example to show you how this franchise system of fractional reserve banking works. Well, historically, it arose through a violation of, uh, of the legal obligations inherent in the deposit contract, demand deposit contract that I explained to you earlier. First, the government did not persecute these violations, but ignored it, ignored the misappropriation of banks of deposits because banks took the money of their depositors and lent it to governments, so they didn't persecute that. And um, only later than governments formally legalized the practice of fractional reserve banking. But let's start again with the with the example of we have here a bank, a bank A. You print one hundred thousand dollars to buy a BMW uh, for your wife. So the BMW uh, the dealer gets the new money and he deposits it in the, in, the, in the bank. So the bank has here new, new cash, the $100,000 you just printed. And uh, liabilities here, we have here the demand deposit. Demand deposit by the, from the BMW dealer which is also, I, did, I said 100,000, no, this would be a very, not yet as expensive, very expensive car, so 100,000. So now the bank holds 100% reserves to the deposit of the BMW dealer, and the dealer deposited the money with the intent of having full availability. And to, according to general legal principles, the obligation of the bank is to maintain always the same as the, in the example of the wheat, always the full deposited good, the tantundum at the availability at, of, of, uh, of the depositor. It has to be available at any time. So imagine that we now give our friend, the bank A, the privilege of holding only 10% reserves instead of safekeeping the money. So this implies that the bank has only hold to in cash $10,000 instead of 100,000. So now the bank can buy assets, it can grant loans to other people, or it can buy 
uh, buy houses, buildings, and pay with newly created deposits. So the bank simply can make loans to a person and put new money in the bank account of this person. So, for example, it can give a loan of 90,000 to person U, let's call him U, and then we have here the demand, we put it in his bank account simply, in the computer, demand deposit of U is 90,000. So now the bank has created $90,000 out of thin air and put it into the bank account of person U. So let's now assume that U uses the, the loan to buy something from another person and gets, uh, gets, uh, gets the cash out of the bank. Then the, demand, the balance sheet of bank A remains like this. Oh, we have here the assets and liabilities. We have still here the demand uh, deposit of 100,000 of the dealer. The demand deposit of you disappears because he gets the cash out of the, out of the bank. So that means cash is only 10,000 10, left. And of course, we have here as the asset, asset of the bank still the loan of 90,000 to person U. Now we have a reserve ratio of 10%, that is 10% of the demand deposits are there in cash. What has happened to the quantity of money? What is the quantity of money that, in our example, people rightly think to have available? How much money does the BMW dealer think he has? Well, he thinks he has $100,000. So, as you do, you, you, and when he makes purchases, he takes into account how much money he has in his bank account, as you do also. When you make a purchase, you know how, more or less how much money you, you have in your bank. And it forms part of your cash balance. So, from an economic point of view, this 100000 forms part of his cash balance. And at the same time, person U has $90,000 in cash that he got from the loan to spend. So now the money supply has increased through credit expansion from 100000 to 190000 100000 in forms of a monetary substitute, the demand deposit, and 90000 in cash in the hands of U. So this is a truly transcendental event because new money was created or money substitutes were created. Now the money supply in the broader sense, including monetary substitutes, is 190,000. And of course, the, the creation of money titles out of thin air is a very profitable business for the banks because I can then I can produce money, I can lend it, then I get it back with interest, or I can, I can invest in stocks, I get dividends, or I buy myself my nice buildings, or last but not least, I, I buy government bonds. But the story does not end here with the creation of 90,000. Let us imagine that you uses the 90,000 and he buys something from person V. And V happens to be client of bank B, and he deposits the money there. So V deposits 90,000 in bank B. So we have here the demand uh, deposit of person V, 90,000. So, so now Bank B can expand credits holding a, and holding a reserve ratio of 10%. It can grant a loan of 81,000 to person W. So it gives a loan of 81,000 
to w and puts it in the bank, bank account of w. Now, uh, W will be, can use his loan, he will get the money from his bank account. So this is um, similar, similar here, when he gets the money out of the bank, the balance sheet remains as follows, of bank B. The cash is reduced to 9,000. Demand deposit of V is there, of course, still, and there's the, the, the loan of 81,000 to W. So let's now assume that V uh, uses the money, buys a house, for example, from person X, and X now happens to be client of bank C, C. So we have here bank C, and he deposits um, the 81,000 in cash in bank C, gets a demand deposit in his bank account appear 80, 81,000. And now if bank C holds 10% reserves, you can see that it can give a loan uh, to another person to person X, it's the next one, of 72,900. That appear in the bank account of X. And when he takes then the money out of the bank, X, uh, the balance sheet of bank C remains as follows. We have here the cash of um, Um, 8,100, demand deposit of 81,000, and here's still the loan. And of course, we could continue this um, much longer, but we have only one hour, so uh, we, we <laughs> let's, uh, let's stop here. Because uh, th then X would, uh, would pay person Y, Y could go to his bank D, uh, deposit the money there, and so on. But we can al already see that how much money do we have now? Well, we have here the 100,000, 90,000, 81,000, plus the 72,900 circulating in cash. When we continue this to the end, which we don't have time, then we would get to, um, we would see that the money supply would be multiplied by 10 with a reserve ratio of, of 10% and under the assumption that there's no frictions or unused loans. So in a miraculous way, the banking system has created new money in the form of bank accounts. Now the money supply is $1 million. So the BMW W dealer, persons V, X, they hold together $1 million in their bank accounts, and the banking system holds a cash reserves ratio of 10%, that is the original 100,000 that we printed to buy the car. So this very profitable business of creating money has only become possible because of the privilege of the government. So in one sense, the, um, the government is the boss of the banking system, and the person you, for example, that gets here the first, f f first loan may be the government itself. So the government gives the banks the privileges to have fractional reserves to create money and exchange the banks finance, finance you by granting you loans or buying your bonds. So if you, put if you put aside all the distracting maneuvers and intricacies, 
it is easier to think of the system of, uh, of one owner of the printing press, that is, that is you, the government, that has this power, and the banking system as one institution. It's like a franchise system of fractional reserve banking. It potent, potentiates the power of money creation. Out of $100,000 newly created, newly printed notes, the system made $1 million. And of course, by buying up the bonds of the government, um, bonds prices are bid up and yields fall and the government also pays lower interest rates. Moreover, as a side effect, you also get very powerful friends. Not only the banks, but the banks, by granting or not granting credits, loans, control or have also a control over the industry. Uh, the, the business establishment that gets dependent on the banking system. Uh, so you make the whole establishment, business establishment, uh, your friend. So this, of course, is a system that is too nice to let it collapse. Um, however, there's one problem because credit expansion leads to business cycles and in recessions, uh, the market value of bank assets collapse and normally the confidence in banks vanish and then people come and demand uh, their money and bank runs occur. With the central bank, of course, and fiat money, you can produce any paper money to bail out any bank. But again, you don't really want this because then there might be hyperinflation that is not in your interest. Because you want to enjoy the division of labor and you want savings to continue. So what you want to do is to control the banking system that that, is, that does not overdo it. So you want to regulate it and control it. So the, through the central bank or through regulations, um, Basel II or Basel III, or through the FDIC. Through these regulations, you can also induce banks to buy more government bonds by twisting the regulation in such a way that you say you have to have so many safe assets and you declare the government bonds um, well, one of those. Um, however, this may not be by may not be enough to prevent harsh recessions, and in a harsh recession, you don't want to overinflate um, the money supply. So you also need taxpayers to bail out banks. Because if you don't, you and you print too much money, the confidence in the, in the money may may vanish, and uh, the system may collapse. So what what you also do is to use you use taxes to to bail out banks, and you have to li li justify it. So you develop the theory of too big to fail, or your friends in academia do that. There's. Uh, there's one paper by Larry White who, where, where he fi finds that 74% of all monetary, all, all papers on monetary theory published in academic journals, 74% are authored, are, are, are all published in Fed published journals or written by, uh, by Fed economists, co-authored by Fed, Federal Reserve economists. So you have them develop this doctrine too of too big to fail, which basically states that uh, the banks are so big that they cannot collapse because that, that would be an apocalypse. So the government has to bail them out with taxpayers' money. Of course, this implicit bailout guarantee for the financial system then leads to even more distortions. And the financial crisis has shown that not only fractional reserve banks got into difficulties, but also investment banks. And investment banks don't do that. They don't accept demand deposits. So why did they get into trouble in the last recession? Because they engaged in what is called maturity mismatching. They indebt themselves uh, short term at low interest rates 
and lend then long term at higher interest rates. They, they exploit the so called yield curve. We have here the yield curve, here the interest rate, and here the maturity. Um, and then the yield curve is normally rising. For example, you have here, here a one year loan, and we have here 5% interest. And the three year loan, there we have 10% interest. Why is it normally rising? Well, because of uncertainty, aversion. Um, we want to be liquid rather sooner than later. Uh, if we have two, think of the following example. You have, you have two options. The first option would be um, you have a five-year five -year bond where that gives you 2.5% interest and then you have you buy it with the option to have an, another five year of 2.5 percent so you get total accumulated interest of five percent it's the first option the second option is you have a 10 year loan of accumulated five percent interest but of course you would choose the first option because there you are liquid rather sooner than later. And this explains why with normally with growing maturities, you have to offer higher or you get higher interest rates. So what did investment, ban investment banks do in the financial crisis where they borrowed, for example, a short term commercial paper, three months commercial paper at 3%, here, 3% for one month. And then they invested for 30 years at five uh, in mortgages at a much higher interest rate, at 5%, for example. So they gain this, they gain this difference of 4%. Of course, this is a problem because after a month, then you, the bank has to repay the commercial paper. So what they have to roll over their loans. They have to find again someone who gives them a loan. They have to try to sell the commercial paper again. The economic problem of this is that you have short-term savings invested in long-term projects. And imagine that people only want to save for three months because they, in three months they go to for, for a vacation and they don't need the money now, so they uh, lend it for three months. However, the savings are taken and invested into a 30 year investment project. So then there's a misalignment in the savings and investment behavior, very similar to the traditional Austrian business cycle theory. And when after a month the loan cannot be renewed because people want to increase consumption now, the 30 year projects will be, are revealed as malinvestments. The banks have to sell the mortgages, the housing prices fall. So in the recent recession, an important part of the bubble was caused by investment banks that mismatched maturities, giving the illusion of an amount of longer term savings that was not there. And that induced many entrepreneurs in, investment, in investing in two long term projects, especially in the housing sector. And this mismatching behavior of investment banks is spurred by several government interventions First, if a bank knows that it will be bailed out by the government because it follows this doctrine of too big to fail, um, then it will be more eager to engage in this maturity mismatching. Or if a, if a bank knows that the central bank will, in times of trouble, buy its assets, buy the mortgages, uh, then it will also engage more in it. Or lastly, fractional reserve banking itself that leads normally to a rising money supply. When the money supply keeps, keeps rising, then it's easier to find someone to roll over, to renew the short-term debt. So to conclude, the connections between central bankers, bankers, and the government are not superficial. 
They form an elite group that cooperates closely. They are very seldom, they are critically critical of each other. They, they fre frequently dine and chat with each other. They switch professions. Investment bankers such as Henry Paulson become secretary, secretary of the treasury. Central bankers such, such as Timothy Geithner become secretary of the treasury. So it's, it's one very interconnected, interconnected group. And what is then done is that the, the government, you have here the government, has here its printing press, its central bank. It prints, it prints uh, bonds and gets then the new money from the central bank. Of course, then the government has to pay interest to the central bank, but, the, but then the central bank, most of the has then profits at the end of the year, and the profits then are returned to the government. So it's a very nice way to finance your expenditures, to finance your deficits. When the, when the bond comes due, you just, you, you don't pay, pay it either, you just issue a new bond, uh, and so on. And, and on, on a lower level, then you can, then the franchise system comes into play. You just put the, the banks there. So you have here the banks, and here we have the central bank. So you sell, to make it, to make it not so obvious, you sell the bank bonds to the banks. You get money from the banks, and the banks then sell the bonds to the central bank or pledge them as collateral for new loans, and they get new, new money, new reserves from, from the central bank. But at the, at, the end of, at the end of the day, the, sim simple is, the system is very simple. It's just a printing press that produces huge temptations, because with it you are able to buy votes and win elections, fulfill political dreams. And it favors well, the, the government and the first receivers of the new money to the detriment of the rest. Of course, you try to conceal it. You, you call the central bank independent. So it's not so obvious. But it's still, the central bank still buys the government bonds or receives it as collateral. And the banks in the franchise system, franchise system, they participate in these advantages of money production and help to finance the government. The investment banks also participate and are protected by implicit bailout guarantees and put additional fire to the booms through maturity mismatching. So while this is all complicated, it all boils down to nothing more than in our thought experiment that one individual, you have a printing press and you use it for your own benefit. So what I said yesterday for money, uh, that no one, almost no one understands money, it's even more true for the financial system, but now you do, and I urge you again, <laughs> spread the truth because only then we will have a chance to go to a free market system and money, and this is crucial for the future of civilization. Thank you very much. Thank you.